Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Jamie Boskett, and I have the privilege of serving as president and CEO of your State History Museum, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all here for tonight's Marshall Scholar Series event. Of course, this evening's program was organized by and is presented by our partners at the John Marshall Center for Constitutional History and Civics, which I'm also proud to serve on the board of. Uh, but we're thrilled as two wonderful institutions so well related uh, to host you all this evening. The Marshall Scholar Series and tonight's wonderful program will focus very specifically and by design on Chief Justice John Marshall's judicial legacy. We're pleased, and I'm guessing that's you, we're pleased to have with us tonight students from Maggie Walker Governor's School, am I right? Wonderful, welcome. And virtually to have with us uh, students from Benedictine College Prep, welcome to you at a distance. And of course, so thrilled to have so many of you that are both members of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture and also the John Marshall Center. And I'll, I'll just say, I hope that you're members of both. If you're not, tonight's the night to fix that. <laughs> there are two things that go beautifully together and that's civics and history. They're a match made in heaven uh, and, and by the way, I hope that you know that John Marshall was the first president of the Historical Society. So truly uh, a match made in heaven, but I digress. Uh, before we get going this evening, I'd like to plant a seed for the next Marshall Scholar Series. That event is going to take place right here in the Robbins Family Forum on January 18th. At that evening, we'll welcome three former U.S. Solicitors General. Noel Francisco, Paul Clement, and Don Varelli. Uh, and I'm, I just can imagine with those, with those three, it will be a, a fascinating evening. So set that on your calendars now. For all of you who are VMHC members, uh, also there are just a few seats remaining. So now is the time to act. A few seats remaining for our annual Hazel and Fulton Chauncey lecture on October 19th in just a couple of weeks. Uh, for this year's lecture, uh, we'll be featuring renowned Civil War scholar Gary Gallagher. Uh, he'll be speaking on a, a unique lecture written for the night called The Other Valley Campaign, Jubal Early's 1864 Shenandoah Operations in both history and memory. Information for both can be found on our respective websites. Uh, and for us at VMHC, that's virginiahistory.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce and welcome forward a friend, Professor Kevin Walsh. Kevin is professor at Catholic University's Columbus School of Law and serves as co-director of the law school's project on constitutional originalism and the Catholic intellectual tradition. His courses focus on federal courts, constitutional law, torts, agency, and partnerships in the law and the Catholic intellectual tradition. Professor Walsh is also a former John Marshall Center uh, board chair, and I will note he is also the one who helped us forge the partnership that allowed for the John Marshall Center to find their new home here at the VMHC where they belong. So if you would please join me in welcoming Kevin Walsh. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jamie. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And I'll start with some good news. You see there's three chairs. I am not the special guest uh, for this evening. We have a, a wonderful program plan uh, with Justice Bill Mims and a special guest. Uh, justice Mims is a senior justice on the Supreme Court of Virginia, having completed his 12 year term on March 31st of this year. He's currently at Christopher Newport. Uh, they're also out there. Hello, students of uh, Professor Mims and uh, teaching the constitution as well as a class on uh, the pandemic, COVID, and uh, uh, sort of the law of the Constitution in relation to this. And he's been teaching for much of uh, his 30 plus year career in the legal profession and in serving uh, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, there are a number of things to say about him, but I'll just highlight a couple that overlap in some ways with John Marshall. So uh, John Marshall was a big walker. In fact, he walked all the way from here to Philadelphia. Uh, when he was, I guess, in his early 20s. Uh, so we were fighting a war at the time and he wanted to get inoculated. Uh, so uh, you got the pandemic connection uh, as well. The other thing, uh, and, and, and what does that have to do with Justice Mims? Welcome to all the runners here. Uh, Justice Mims uh, is, a, is a big runner and 
uh, championed for the bar a wellness initiative that focused on uh, all sorts of aspects of, of lawyer well-being, social, physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, occupational, and intellectual. And uh, the, the, the second connection to John Marshall is that he is a true triple threat. Uh, and I was trying to think of how to put it, because it's not a triple crown. That sounds royal, and this is America. Uh, it's sort of, uh, but, but he has served at the highest levels of all three branches of Virginia government. Uh, so he, he was a deputy attorney general and then attorney general. Uh, he was a delegate uh, representing Loudoun County in the uh, 90s and then a senator as well then as uh, on the Supreme Court of Virginia. So this matches uh, John Marshall, who served at the highest levels of all three branches of the United States uh, government. So uh, it is my pleasure to welcome a citizen jurist a treasurer to the Commonwealth and a former board member of the John Marshall Center and a friend of both institutions and many of us here. Welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. So you've already told them that I'm a threat. I think I said I was trying to find the right word, but. Uh... So, so I'm a John Marshall groupie. I'll admit it. Um, you're a John Marshall groupie. How did how groupie. did you become a John Marshall groupie? So I teach all of his big cases in con law, but they're just cases. I think I, I received a um, a copy of his letters and papers that was done for the Library of America, and I just read uh, what he had written and just letters. And I tell you, if you read them, you just you just like the guy. Yeah. And then you realize he was everywhere in U.S. history. So. Uh, yeah. How yeah. about you? Yeah. You know, I practiced law in Leesburg and a lot of my cases were in Warrington and in Warrington, in that ancient courthouse, there is the portrait of John Marshall right behind the bench. So I would be talking with the live judge and the great chief justice would be looking down on me. And, and I kind of thought that every now and then he went like this. <laughs> no um, pressure. Yeah, right? Exactly right. <laughs> And then I moved here, and I, I was just fascinated with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Um, yeah, he was the first president. Um, I, I, I actually got to see his robe when you arranged for it to be here. I saw his copy of The Federalist here. Um, I, I could just imagine being in Richmond with him and, uh, and you know, just drinking Madeira. And, and you're right, just you know, talking with him. That would have been yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, so I want to begin with a, a satirical tongue-in-cheek poem that Carl Sandburg wrote, um, because it's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about in terms of uh, his, his life. Um, but Carl Sandburg said, the lawyers, Bob, that would, you know, that would be you and me, we, the lawyers, Bob, know too much. They're the chums of the books of old John Marshall. They know it all, what a dead hand wrote. A stiff dead hand and its knuckles crumbling. The bones of the fingers, a thin white ash. The lawyers know a dead man's thoughts too well. Sandberg clearly didn't know John Marshall because Marshall comes alive. He's, he really moves among us when we're a place, at a place like this. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, it would, yeah, it, it yeah. Well, too bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, good evening. Uh, good, good, e good evening. <laughs> you know, good heavens! Why are there so many fine citizens gathered all together here this evening? Uh, to what purpose? Well, you know, it's highly improper. Who, who are you? <laughs> I'm the spirit of John Marshall. Oh, yeah. he's oh. just been talking about me. The spirit of John and when I, did you mention something about Madeira? Oh yes. Oh well, you know Madeira is very hard to find, and when I uh, thought there might be a chance of Madeira, I thought I would stop in and see if I could get some. I understand you used to buy it by the pike, like 110 gallons at a time. Well, yeah, it well, has an endless shelf life; it never goes bad. Excellent. Well, yeah, apparently you either. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm a well fortified spirit. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Chief Justice, please, it would be wonderful if you would sit down. Uh, well, I'd love to ask you some questions. Well, uh, you know, I've been following your career uh, for some time, Justice Mims. And uh -oh. 
I suppose I could be standing here speaking as one long serving justice to another long serving justice. But uh, if you've offered a chair, I'll confess, I think I'll take you up on that. I'm now about 267 years old, and sometimes I get tired rather easily. So yeah. <laughs> I will take my seat if that's agreeable. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you. You know, you don't look a day over 250. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I suppose I'm ready to uh, answer your first question, if you have any. Yeah, I, you know, I do. And, and the question that has fascinated me for a long time is the revolution and your relationship very early in your life with George Washington. You were at, you were at Valley Forge where, where the nation was forged to, to you know, actually say something like that. It's, what was that like? Well, tell, tell us, let's go back to the beginning. Yes. Well, I, I went into the army uh, and became a captain in uh, the uh, Continental Establishment and served at Valley Forge, as you correctly point out. And, I will say that my long uh, wartime service in the Army cured me of my youthful enthusiasms for uh, unlimited pure democracy. Uh -huh. What I found was that uh, when we were there uh, in uh, the ranks, I became familiar with a wide range of uh, brother soldiers who had come from all the other constituent uh, states of our uh, league or union of states under the confederation and it became clear to me that i was not alone in my convictions that here was a band of brothers that were willing to uh, serve together in a common cause for something most precious in fact we were willing to spill our blood when there were some other people who were content to spill their ink <laughs> yeah I you know, know i i you I, I, I would say that it was that experience in the army that confirmed to me in my beliefs that Congress uh, was my government, and the United States was my country. Wow, that's excellent. So now, I want to go. I'm going to jump forward ten years to the constitutional debate, mm -hmm. the ratification debate in Virginia. The vote was exceptionally close. I think 89 to 78, if I recall. 79. 79. Okay. And don't forget Patrick Henry. Well, no, that's that's where I'm going. Yeah. So Patrick Henry is the primary opponent. He is also the greatest orator of the age. James Madison, not so much when it comes to being an orator. And he tasked you as a young lawyer with going head to head with Patrick Henry. What was that like? Well, we should not forget uh, Edmund Pendleton, yeah. who played an important role in the Virginia ratification debates. This was in the summer of 1788. I remember that very well. Um, the debates were ardent. Uh, they were eloquent. Mm -hmm. uh, today, they are poorly represented in print, uh, to be fair. And I must say that Patrick Henry uh, made his arguments with all of his usual arts and commanded a considerable following opposed to the Constitution. That's something we should remember, that the, the intrinsic merits of the Constitution and the weight of character of those who were supporting it, those were not enough in themselves to guarantee its ratification in Virginia. And uh, it, uh, it was, as you say, a very close vote uh, in the end. Mm -hmm. And I did everything. I made three floor speeches, as I recall, on various uh, points. And I even, I think I even quoted the Greeks that united we stand and divided we fall and so on. But, yeah. uh, all right. Now, so you mentioned others spilled their ink. You may have been referring to the sage of Monticello. I'll, I, the the I'll great know. llama of the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Hmm. So he, he didn't like Henry very much either. In fact, I remember at one point he wrote to James Madison saying they should ardently pray for Patrick Henry's death. Um, Jefferson was, <laughs> well, at least he was praying. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson was your second cousin. Um, A cousin you, cousin. Yeah, you all didn't get along very well. Tell, tell us about that. Well, can I speak candidly? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not under oath, but I'll speak <laughs> candidly. Um, I've always thought Mr. Jefferson to be more of a speculative philosopher than a practical statesman. 
he had this curious idea that we should throw out our constitution every 19 years and come up with a new one. That is impracticable. And or reflect on this. Uh, if under the peculiar notions of Mr. Jefferson's approach to the federal constitution, the Louisiana Purchase, which he himself uh, has described as a blessing, uh, you know, replete, uh, transaction replete with blessings for unborn millions of people. Uh, under his doctrine, he might have found that the Louisiana Purchase was unconstitutional. And then where would our nation be now? It doesn't make any sense. I, I recall he uh, he at first said that it was unconstitutional, and then when Napoleon had second thoughts, he suddenly decided that maybe it was constitutional after all. Well, once again, Secretary Madison came to Jefferson's relief. Yeah. yeah. So so Jefferson and Adams had a rapprochement later in life. They they didn't get along uh, when uh, when Adams was president, but then later on they patched up. Did you and your cousin ever patch it up? No. <laughs> I, I will say this, uh, Mr. Jefferson and I would agree that uh, one of the most uh, sacred of the duties of a government is to provide equal uh, justice to all of its citizens. I've more or less paraphrased my cousin in that respect, and I, I would sign on to that opinion. Um, but um, in truth, Mr. Jefferson fell on difficult financial times towards the end of his long eventful life. And I did agree uh, to be chairman of uh, the Richmond chapter of a large lottery scheme that was contemplated to raise funds through private subscriptions to relieve uh, Mr. Jefferson's debts in his uh, older age. Uh, but his death uh, shortly after um, caused the scheme not to go into effect. Well, that was magnanimous of you. That was, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Jefferson and Adams, you mentioned his death. They, they both died on July 4th. You know, uh, I don't mind Mr. Adams dying on the 4th of July so much, but it seems like Mr. Jefferson gets way too much credit for dying on the 4th of July. I just want to know, could, could I perhaps get some credit for sharing a birth date with the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> I was born on the 24th of September, 1755. The Supreme Court of the United States was born by federal statute on the 24th of September, 1789, when I was 34 years old. That should be worth something. Yeah. So, well, happy birthday. Uh, I mean, oh. two, two weeks late. <laughs> Shall we sing for you? Well, maybe at my next month's uh, lawyer's dinner. Okay. After we've drunk a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, one before I before I leave Jefferson, I have one more question to ask. <clears throat> he said that Virginia was his country. Yeah. Um, you are a Federalist, a proud Federalist. Um, do you consider yourself to be a, a Federalist first uh, or a Virginian first? Uh, in other words, is was Virginia your country? Or is America your country? America is my country. I think sometimes if you wish to pose the question, should I be a Virginian or should I be an American, that it is absolutely unnecessary to make a distinction between the two. Uh, consider this, my friend. Patrick Henry, my father witnessed Virginian Patrick Henry say, give me liberty or give me death. A Virginian, Mr. Jefferson, wrote the uh, Declaration of American Independence. Mr. Madison is considered the father of our federal constitution for a more perfect union. Yet another Virginian, George Mason, uh, was the ceaseless advocate, uh, maybe the godfather for adding a U.S. Bill of Rights to our federal constitution. The greatest Virginian of all, George Washington, becomes the father of our country. With a legacy like that, why choose between Virginia and America? They are practically synonymous. I, I don't have any uh, objection to hearing the phrase American people. 
You know, that's, that's the kind of answer I would have expected from perhaps Alexander Hamilton as well. Mm -hmm. So let's, actually, let's move on to him. You know, he's become rather popular in the past decade or so. <laughs> Can you sing? Uh, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, sir. Wow. Yeah. So we're not going to get a reprise of that. No. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> there are those who have noted that your opinions actually allowed Hamilton to achieve his agenda from the grave. He died in 1804. Mm -hmm. He was a proponent of the first national bank, uh, which also died. But then the second national bank rose from the ashes. And in your McCulloch um, versus Maryland case, you, uh, you upheld that. He was a, as a New Yorker, he was a strong proponent of, uh, of commerce and particularly maritime commerce. Gibbons v. Ogden, you upheld that. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and on. Um, are you a, uh, would you say that you're a Hamiltonian big government guy? Well, I, I would say that uh, both Alexander Hamilton and I were uh, fellow federalists, but I would not go so far to say that I looked upon Alexander Hamilton as a personal friend. Hmm. Uh, it is undeniable that uh, the behind the scenes actions of Mr. Hamilton did more than any other thing to prevent John Adams from winning election to be uh, president for a second term. Mm -hmm. And I am very slow to forgive Alexander Hamilton for that. Uh, the consequences of his meddling against John <laughs> Adams was that I was bound to stand there and swear in my cousin, Mr. Jefferson, to the office instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I will, I will say that uh, both Hamilton and I, in, in our earlier years, um, were concerned about safeguarding the newly established federal government. Um, in the eyes of many people, the federal government was but a young sibling uh, jostling amongst many elder and jealous state governments. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me self-evident that thank you to the supremacy clause in the federal constitution, whenever powers are expressly delegated to the federal government, those powers are supreme. Having said that, I have never argued for an unlimited grant of power uh, at the federal level. We must always ask ourselves important questions. Um, you know, the powers that might be under adjudication, are they necessary? Are they proper? Do they, uh, will they be carried out by the usual and customary means? Uh, are, are these uh, justifiable means uh, best calculated to arrive at legitimate ends? And so forth. And the, frankly, are such exercises of federal power uh, consistent with both the letter and the spirit of our laws? These are important questions, to be sure. And you, you mentioned uh, Gibbons v. Ogden. Uh, that was an interesting case. Uh, in that case, uh, in dealing with steamboat monopolies, as you'll recall, this was a, an occasion for the Supreme Court to look into uh, the question of a specifically enumerated power to Congress, uh, you know, to regulate commerce. And so the question becomes, um, to what degree does a granted power uh, to Congress uh, coexist with or infringe upon uh, older state powers? Uh, and in the end, I, I will confess that um, <laughs> the court uh, regarding those steamboats, uh, we steered a very careful course of uh, statuary uh, statutory construction in order to an avoid a collision uh, between the rival camps of concurrent powers of the states with the federal government versus exclusive grants of power to the federal government only. Well, you were dealing with New Jersey versus New York at that point, so I can see how you would want to steer a careful course. Oh, yes. Yeah. Not, not yeah. a Virginian in the house. No. So. 
But speaking of uh, speaking of Northerners, let's uh, let's move on when, when, when talking about Hamilton. Let's move on to Aaron Burr, a truly a, a, a tragic tragic figure, uh, and uh, he uh, he is also now well known because of the musical, but perhaps not as well loved as Hamilton. Um, but uh, interestingly, he also has been in the news. Um, I, uh, you, um, yeah, I'm sure you've been paying attention uh, up, up until 2020. We had a New Yorker as our president, uh, Mr. Trump. And um, he, uh, he was rather litigious, still is. And um, he uh, was, was um, documents were demanded by, uh, by the local prosecutor in New York. He refused to provide them. And it went all the way to your court and your successor, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote a, uh, a just a fascinating opinion um, that that actually conjured up the Burr treason trial, and pointed out that uh, that Burr had uh, um, had subpoenaed Thomas Jefferson to appear and to bring documents, and uh, uh, Jefferson declined to travel down to Richmond where the trial was going on, but he did send the documents. And that was a 200 and some year old precedent that the chief justice relied upon. You signed that subpoena. Uh, tell us about that trial and what it was like. That trial drew enormous crowds to the Capitol here in Richmond. Uh, where our federal circuit court case was granted a venue to hold uh, our sessions. And why, why were you sitting outside of the Supreme Court? Oh, well, I was writing circuit. Okay. Uh, for, for many generations, uh, any justice on the Supreme Court was also expected to ride on the federal circuit. And uh, in my case, uh, I was here at Richmond, and also I would go down to Raleigh in North Carolina uh, about twice the year in both uh, venues. Uh, but you've asked about the trial, and I vividly remember that the general public was very well aware of the extreme animosity that President Jefferson held towards uh, his former vice president, who we might say was truly a burr in the side of my <laughs> cousin. But it, it was rather irregular, I thought, when President Jefferson, uh, in a message to Congress, declared that Aaron Burr's guilt was beyond question, and he issued the message before the grand jury even met to consider an indictment. But once the grand jury did indict Burr, uh, of course, uh, it proceeded to trial. And as I mentioned, um, we had the largest room in the Capitol, the House chamber, uh, to hold our sessions. And one of the uh, first questions that came up was, well, the defense at an early stage uh, demanded a subpoena be issued by the circuit court to the sitting president, Thomas Jefferson, to obtain evidence in his possession that was deemed material uh, to the defense. And uh, in considering whether a subpoena could issue to a sitting president, uh, there's a rather simple argument to make. Um, to become president of the United States, you must be a citizen of the United States. And in our conception of justice, no citizen should be above or beyond the reach of law. So the subpoena was issued. Mr. Jefferson had an interesting take on the subpoena. He uh, was of the opinion that he had the unilateral executive privilege of deciding whether or not to pay any attention to it. If he thought it was dangerous to the national interest, then he was not obliged to answer the, uh, the subpoena. Well, and here in the court, uh, my fellow uh, federal judge, uh, Cyrus Griffin, and I, who you know, were on the circuit court uh, presiding over this trial, you know, it occurred to us that we might meet the president halfway, it was our considered judgment that if the evidence was potentially sensitive to the, the, the well-being of the nation, 
then the court had the authority to review that evidence privately and then make a determined informed opinion of its own whether or not the subpoena should be issued. So how was this uh, difference of interpretation resolved? Uh, Mr. Jefferson decided, uh, as you've pointed out, that he would uh, supply the evidence uh, being uh, sought, which was a cipher letter, and um, uh, therefore the, the, the question became moot. Okay. Yeah. Now, so that's the whole issue of the subpoena. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, there were other interesting issues that this trial uh, brought to the attention of, of the world. I mean, something as basic as what standard of proof should apply to determine guilt or innocence on the capital crime of treason. If you are in Europe and you're sitting on a throne, chances are you prefer the constructive doctrine of treason. And that is to say that if a somebody in your opposition to your rule or your authority or your powers, if you have an opponent, you can decide that they seem like a traitor, they look like a traitor, they sound like a traitor, they dress like a traitor, and so you can construe that maybe they probably are a traitor and off with their head. Public execution, drawing and quartering. That's the constructive doctrine. So should that be uh, our guide in uh, considering a treason trial in an American court. What say you? Nay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is only one capital crime expressly described in our federal constitution, and it is the crime of treason. The constitution established a legal standard that must be met. There must be two witnesses to an overt act of treason absent the defendant making an open confession in court. And Mr. Burr was not about to oblige us with an open confession. Now consider this. I understand that President Jefferson uh, filled out and signed a large bundle of presidential pardons, leaving the names of those to be pardoned blank, and then delivered this bundle of uh, pre-signed presidential pardons to the prosecution here in Richmond with the invitation to go and find as many witnesses as they possibly could. And indeed, the uh, pre-signed pardons worked wonders, and there was an enormous list of witnesses that the prosecution was going to call in the uh, trial proceedings. And here's the problem. Only one of those witnesses, General Wilkinson, something of an artist in treason in his own right, I would venture to guess, only Wilkinson could appear and testify to what he claimed was an overt act. And when the prosecution admitted they had no other witnesses that could meet that standard of proof, I said, we are done listening to witnesses. And at that point, uh, the case was remanded uh, to the jury. Now think on this a moment. The jury was under enormous pressure. It is well known that Jefferson was very much expecting a conviction in this case. And it was common knowledge even to the defense, that 10 of the 12 members of the jury were known sympathizers to the political philosophies of Mr. Jefferson. The jury retired. They came back down from uh, the upper floor and they handed in a verdict, most curiously worded verdict. Something to this effect, speaking from memory, we of the jury find Aaron Burr not proved to be guilty <laughs> under this indictment by any evidence shown us. We therefore find him not guilty. That finding had consequences around the nation. I will confess that 
the many months that were spent making this inquiry into treason in the court here at Richmond were very fatiguing and they were very unpleasant. But the subject of treating treason in a court of law, that was a deplorably serious one. I might have made it less serious to myself, Justice Mims, if I had decided to follow the public will instead of the public law. I chose to be guided by the law. That was magnificent. But so much of what you talked about is magnificent. <clears throat> we can't talk with you and not talk about Marbury v. Madison. Your your greatest oh, judicial, yes, 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 <laughs> your greatest judicial legacy. And there you essentially had to find the law because it wasn't written in the Constitution. Tell us, was that a hard case? Uh, what, what was that like for you and for the court? I think everybody will well remember um, that the, the political times in which the Marbury v. Madison case unfolded were very partisan times. In fact, uh, as I well recall, uh, the Judiciary Act of 1801 was a year later repealed and replaced by the friends of Mr. Jefferson and a new Judiciary Act of 1802 and the net effect of that meant that we lost an entire year uh, before we could sit again as a court. And then we would from thenceforth only sit once the year in Washington, D.C., instead of more frequently, as had been prior to the case. So the politics even got into a, a delaying uh, our ability to sit in here, the case of Marbury v. Madison. I've, I've always thought that <laughs> I have a grievance the defendant and counsel for the defendant in Marbury v. Madison never even made appearance in court. The prosecution uh, was there and delivered eloquent arguments in behalf of Mr. Marbury and uh, those associated with his suit. But it, it, this is my point. Now, I've always thought that I have been given way too much credit for originality in expounding judicial review at the federal level. Why would I say that? There was ample, ample precedent for judicial review in many different state courts prior to the adoption of our Constitution. Right here in Virginia, no less. Uh, there are very important comments that come to my mind now uh, from Senior Justice uh, Edmund Pendleton and uh, that remarkable learned scholar, uh, George Wythe. Uh, speaking to uh, judicial review. So uh, I merely, I just merely applied an existing doctrine at the federal level. That's all I think I ever did. And it's, it, I'm glad you brought this up because to me, to me, the real difficulty, in fact, the peculiar delicacy in this case was when or even whether the judiciary could inquire into uh, the actions of the executive branch. Now there is something uh, to discuss. And in the end, uh, we found that in reviewing actions of the executive branch, those actions can be classed as either ministerial or political. If it's a political act or determination of policy, the court has no say in the matter. But if it is a, a ministerial function, that is reviewable by the courts. And because of ministerial malfeasance on the part of the Jefferson administration, Mr. Marbury had been denied a signed and sealed commission to sit as a judge. And that to me, um, uh, was an injury that was eligible for redress. The problem was 
a careful reading of the United States Constitution <clears throat> made it plain to us on the court that we were not the proper venue to hear the suit. It should have been brought in a lower court. And there you have uh, the, the, you know, the summation of Marbury v. Madison. You know, it may surprise you that 219 years later, and there are, it's, is that Madeira? No. Oh. <laughs> well, there might be some later on. I think so. Yeah, okay. Um, 219 years later, there's still some controversy because the words judicial review are not in the Constitution itself. So I want to. There wanna... is nothing in the federal Constitution to prohibit it. Is the power prohibited? No. Okay. Is it the usual and proper means for uh, obtaining justice? Yes. And so on. Next. <laughs> <laughs> You, I am, I'm speechless. But I want to, <laughs> uh, I want to ask the professor what his thoughts are because those who are making the argument make the argument that it's not in the Constitution, and in fact, the only reference you can find that's contemporaneous is Alexander Hamilton, that guy again, mm. in Federalist seventy eight. But he says there's some perplexity about the doctrine. And, and by the way, uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, Professor Walsh, aren't you also a practicing attorney? I am. Oh, I, very I, I need. I need your yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but you're you're a scholar, and you you are an originalist scholar. And can one be both an originalist and a proponent of judicial review? Absolutely. And I, I so first, just as a as a lawyer, you'd say when you're putting together your law that applies in a case. It would be a mistake and malpractice not to consider the Constitution as potential law in your case. And that's ultimately, uh, it, and I agree with uh, Mr. Chief Justice, that uh, Marbury was unoriginal. And I think that that is a virtue. Uh, so, uh, the, But you should still read the opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and in the opinion, uh, you, you, you had this language, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, that, that described the written Constitution as the greatest improvement uh, in the science of government. Mm -hmm. And as an example to the world. Yes, an example to the world. And we write things down so we remember them. So which makes sense with other things we write down and the powers that are granted to the government, as well as the powers that are not granted to the government. And you, you mentioned the birthday of the Supreme Court, the Judiciary Act of 1789. Mm -hmm. Section 25 of the Judiciary Act, where Congress is creating the, uh, the new court system, including one Supreme Court. We have one Supreme Court to make sure that federal law is applied uniformly throughout the land. And so if a state court got federal law wrong in a way that hurt the federal right holder, Congress said you can take it to the Supreme Court. And they included the Constitution among the things that a state court, because they even presume state courts would be uh, applying the Constitution, uh, that you could take that to, to the Supreme Court. So uh, Marbury versus Madison, wonderful opinion. Uh, but not new in terms of uh, what it what it established, and maybe this idea that judges, just by issuing opinions, and they're, they're called opinions, uh, just by issuing opinions, somehow make law in uh, the same way that Congress or the ratifiers did. I think that's the uh, novel doctrine. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. it, it was also very convenient that the question at hand, um, the court was able to show shelf self restraint against its own powers, the judicial branch. Uh, that was convenient. It was, it was awfully convenient also. Uh, you said the lawyers for the defense didn't show up, but they still won. Uh, but you, you, you got to write a whole opinion about how uh, Jefferson broke the law and violated Marbury's rights. And then conveniently, you didn't have to have a direct conflict. Instructive uh, by obiter dicta. So yeah, this I tell you what, man. I just I feel like this is great. Um, I'm out. So I'm out. yeah, no, I'm loving it. But you've both mentioned the opinion. You you said to these fine people that they should read it. Um, they might not realize that it runs almost twenty thousand words. Um, did you not have a word processor? <laughs> My word processor here. 
fortified by Madeira from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, our, our time is running a little bit short. I, there is a, a very serious topic that I, I want to get to. I, I've, we've enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the laughter, and we will have more of it. But we need to talk about one topic in particular, and that's slavery. The, um, we have been engaged in an intense and often a painful dialogue nationally and here in Richmond about the legacy of slavery. And um, it's well known that, that you did not free your slaves, but your mentor and teacher, George Wythe, did. <clears throat> it's, it's less well known, but it, but it really is something that's important to mention that your namesake, the great dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, supported slavery for most of his life. But then in 1871, prior to going on the Supreme Court, he repudiated that belief. He did a complete 180, as, uh, as we would say. And let me, let me quote from his, uh, from his words at the time. <clears throat> I have lived long enough to feel and declare that the most perfect despotism that has ever existed on this earth was the institution of African slavery. With slavery, it was death or tribute. It knew no compromise. It tolerated no middle course. I rejoice that it is gone. Do you agree with your namesake? Yes. With a new perspective gained over the last 267 years, I can now say that uh, I feel honored that a federal justice who so eloquently celebrated the end of slavery by some happy chance of fate was actually named after me. Uh, I also rejoice that the end of slavery uh, did not bring about a permanent end to our federal union. Mm -hmm. And it is also highly appropriate for a change of this magnitude to have been legally secured by way of a federal amendment to the federal constitution that had been offered by Congress and ratified uh, by the states. I will candidly confess that during my long lifetime, I owned a very large number of enslaved people. History has passed a judgment on that practice, that practice that my, my social peers and myself uh, engaged in. In reply to that judgment, I do not have a credible defense. Unlike my cousin, Mr. Jefferson, I did not write very much about slavery in my personal correspondence. But as a lawyer, I did have an opportunity to argue in favor of the manumission of hundreds of slaves in a contested uh, will case, uh, Pleasance v. Pleasance, was argued in the Virginia court. And later in my career, when I was on the bench of the Supreme Court, I, I suppose the most forceful language that I ever included in a court opinion uh, uh, about slavery was in uh, 1825 uh, with the Antelope case, wherein I admitted um, on paper that slavery was contrary to natural law. Why? Because every man is entitled to the fruits of his own labor. Uh, the case, as so many of these are, was extremely complex. And in the end, uh, the court found a way to free almost 130 of those unfortunate souls who had been rescued from a slave ship that was uh, on the open oceans at the time. 
and uh, those who we found a way to legally free were repatriated uh, back to, uh, in this case, uh, the uh, Liberia, uh, what is now the Republic of Liberia. Uh, I will also admit that there were well over 30 other souls uh, that were bound up in that case that uh, did not uh, achieve their freedom. I also remember uh, during my tenure on the Supreme Court, there were, um, there were several um, freedom suits that came to us uh, in behalf of individuals enslaved. You know, before 1819, if memory serves, or rather before 1829, I don't think any of those freedom suits, uh, the plaintiffs were successful. I remember this because I wrote most of those majority opinions. But after 1829, there were several more suits, freedom suits. And in those cases, the plaintiffs achieved their freedom. Now, my critics will point out that I did not write the majority opinions in those later cases. But I will simply observe, neither did I pen any dissents. I think that history is the volume of human experience. Yeah. Many have said that experience can be the parent of wisdom. Future generations have the opportunity to gain new knowledge, new insights, uh, to form new uh, and informed precedents, precedents uh, to guide our conduct uh, with the overarching goal of justice in our human affairs. I think it's fair to say that the abolition of slavery has been a compelling and complete victory in the court of history. I see no reason for that opinion to be reversed on appeal. Mr. Chief Justice, thank you for your, your candor and your wisdom. And I want to I wanna move to back to your mentor, the man who you said was the, the greatest American of all time, George Washington. Even now, many students read his rules of civility and good conduct and learn from them. Some have suggested that we should buy that volume, it's a small volume, we should buy it by the box load and send it to Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, as a friend of Washington, your mentor, what advice about civility and humility would you give this generation of office holders? I am eager to advise that for anyone holding any office of public trust and service, always try to be guided by wisdom and by virtue. Uh, you mentioned George Washington. Um, in my view, in my own experience, General Washington, President George Washington, farmer citizen George Washington, he was always providing an example in both his public life and in his personal life of striving for wisdom and virtue and temperance and justice. I think basically those are the four cardinal um, traits of character that uh, the classical peoples have talked about. And by the way, when I became president of this historical society, I wasted no time in presenting the society's library with a signed copy of my own uh, official biography of George Washington, mm -hmm. which in the first edition stretched to five volumes. And uh, I have since edited down to just one volume for the school. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope they still have their copy. Um, but uh, beyond George Washington, uh, thinking back over time, <laughs> at least one or more of my grandchildren uh, will um, understand this. I, I would recommend a close reading of the letters of Cicero. 
uh, to his son in the declining days of the Roman Republic. Uh, I have found that uh, there is much distilled and timeless wisdom about uh, the reciprocal duties that citizens owe to one another and the component parts of uh, a, a just society. In fact, I, I can remember, I was thinking about this during the, uh, the Burr treason trial. Cicero once declared, we should never swerve from the path of duty. Roman noblesse oblige. And I've thought about that. We should never swerve from the path of duty. I would offer a codicil. Even when that path becomes a little rugged from time to time. In my own public life, uh, I served in the three different branches of our government and in the three different levels of the local and the state and the federal levels of our government and in various capacities, uh, you know, as a lawmaker or as a cabinet member or uh, as a judge, in all these uh, public duties, I have always sought to credit my opponents with motives that are as sincere as my own. I have always sought to seek a consensus on fundamental principles. And by the way, it's been my experience that you can often gather more of a consensus with the judicious application of wine <laughs> and other ardent spirits uh, to facilitate uh, agreement among various parties. And uh, you know, I wish this was Madeira, but it is liquid in a vessel and uh, I, I can't resist the opportunity. Could I offer a toast? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. To the people of Richmond and the Commonwealth of Virginia, brave soldiers in time of war, good neighbors in time of peace, and good citizens at all times. Hear, hear. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chief Justice and Justice Mims. Uh, we do have time for uh, some questions. Uh, there's two rules. Um, one is wait for the mic to come around. Uh, and the other is the questions must be directed to someone with justice in their title. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I will um, so go ahead and, and raise your hand and um, I will. Um, well, it's like class will call on people. You're safe <laughs> on the Internet, though, uh, right now. Any questions? All right. Right here. You touched on executive you, privilege. So I was just wondering the lack of enforcement mechanisms that the Supreme Court has and their reliance on the executive branch for enforcement is executive privilege, not a natural. And I guess we could read into it and say intended byproduct of that. Hmm, that's something we could probably all speak to. Um, uh, you, your question prompts me to say that when you consider the respective health of our three branches of government. Congress has the power of the purse and patronage. The executive branch has the power of the sword and patronage. The Supreme Court, we have only the power of our own good example. Yes. Uh, uh, wait for the mic, please. It will come. I think he's a re relative of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of them, I by do. the way. Yes. <laughs> I do live Hundreds. at uh, Thomas Jefferson's boyhood home. 
and I've been uh, on the John Marshall Center board since, as long as many, uh, since 2013, I believe. And one of our missions is to uh, promote remembrance of you and your uh, great contribution as the great Chief Justice. And uh, I, for one, am troubled by the uh, current lack of trust and respect that we see today for the Supreme Court. And uh, I, for one, think that uh, one of the things we might do uh, in your memory uh, at the John Marshall Center is explore more about your, uh, I'll call it jurisprudential uh, philosophy. And when I think about um, the common sense and the consensus building that you brought to the court, and I think about um, some of the, I guess I would call it uh, common sense reasoning, uh, for instance, in McCullough versus Maryland, applying uh, the, the uh, supremacy clause, if you will, and uh, extrapolating that the power to tax is the power to destroy. Um, I think uh, we could learn a lot from your approach, and often you didn't have precedent because you had a lot of uh, cases of first impression. And uh, I would challenge my uh, brethren on the board of the center to explore more about your judicial and jurisprudential philosophy. And I was wondering if you might offer us some words of guidance and if you think I'm on the right track and uh, exploring that avenue. Well, that's, I almost feel a conflict of interest on that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, and I'm long retired from all boards and commissions, and it's about time. I, I've, I've been known to say that I had at one point forgotten just how many societies and clubs and uh, uh, other organizations that I had joined on as a vigorous member to. Uh, any opportunity I could find to join uh, with others uh, it was something I was slow to uh, to ignore, and uh, maybe on this occasion I'll try and do that. And uh, what, what comments would you have? Well, um, so it's johnmarshallcenter.org. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. It's uh, it's a main for if you are not yet on the uh, um, on the list uh, uh, for the John Marshall Center, please do so, so that we can all learn more about you, and but particularly um, as your descendant just mentioned, um, how your jurisprudence affects um, all of our lives, that it's not just simply lawyer speak, it really is wisdom that, that needs to be shared. I do have to ask, how many children did you have? Well, there were 10 children in total born to me and my, my dearest Polly, uh, Mary uh, Ambler. Uh, uh, four of the children died uh, in earlier ages, and we did have five sons and one daughter uh, to uh, grow up to maturity, and the uh, daughter uh, ended up inheriting uh, our house, uh, which is on Ninth Street. And I understand the cross street; they've renamed it Marshall Street. Yes, you know? indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, as I understand it, uh, the house is little changed uh, from when I was living yeah. there for a few decades. And uh, uh, the, the, um, the, you know, it, it, think about the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, the preamble to the Constitution speaks to um, our posterity. Children are the future of our nation. And <laughs> my family was small. Uh, with my wife and I compared to my parents' family. I was the eldest of 15 children, and we all grew to maturity. Well, I must say, your, your children were prolific. Uh, it's, uh, George Washington may not have fathered the country, but it appears that you may have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I might uh, give uh, grace of first place to Mr. Henry. Okay, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Question up front. Justice Marshall, can you hear me? I can. Okay. 
What is your take on the overturning of Roe v. Wade? Ah. <laughs> this is so easy, madam. I have none. <laughs> I do believe the 14th Amendment and, uh, and any discussions of privacy came after you had expired. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose my commission expired when I expired. So uh, my opinions are, uh, any opinions I would deliver now would carry no weight whatsoever. Uh, but but you, you do uh, raise an interesting, more general topic. Uh, during the time I was on the court, uh, there was not a consensus that the Bill of Rights to our federal constitution would apply to the states. Uh, it was largely uh, accepted that the Bill of Rights were controlling for the federal government, but it was only uh, much later. Uh, I believe it's called the Doctrine of Incorporation. Uh, you mentioned the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. in particular, uh, where, where the Bill of Rights received even greater force and effect. But, but even, consider this, even if the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states, did you stop and consider? You know, there are 10 of them famously. And by the way, it was the action of the Virginia General Assembly meeting here in Richmond at the Capitol in December of 1791 that got the proposed Bill of Rights uh, uh, over the finish line of the three-fourths uh, required. Uh, you know, it was funny math. Um, Vermont had snuck into the union when nobody was looking. <laughs> And so three-fourths of 14 states, when the agitation was going on for a Bill of Rights to be added, um, we needed 10.5 legislatures to uh, adopt uh, the proposed amendments, uh, which meant, of course, uh, we needed 11. And uh, Virginia's General Assembly, they were the 11th uh, ratification and concurrence of the Bill of Rights. In fact, they went for all 12 on offer, but only 10. Um, had um, the support of the requisite number of other states. Yeah. And, and my, my, my final point on that is this, that about half of those amendments are either speaking directly to the exercise of police powers or defining what the best practices are in our courts of law. Go back and study them with that point in view that if Article Three of the Constitution is by far shorter and briefer than Articles One and Two, talking about the other two branches, well, take the Bill of Rights and incorporate about half of them into Article Three, if you will, and this helps to expand our understanding of the proper operations uh, of a federal judiciary. Um, I'm right here. Uh, you've actually created a very good segue because my question for um, Justice Marshall, is um, what your opinions were on the Bill of Rights when it was being considered and what you think its most important effects have been? I, I am rather of the same mind as was uh, James Madison. Remember, he's the short one. <laughs> <laughs> but a towering intellect was James Madison, an enlightened advocate for a more perfect union. And of course, when the Constitution was being agitated in Virginia and uh, Patrick Henry and his allies were marshaling a, um, oh, that is a bad choice of words, uh, <laughs> were, were gathering together uh, substantial opposition to the Bill of Rights, what was one of their biggest talking arguments against ratification? The absence of a Bill of Rights. And yet, those of us who were ardent advocates for the adoption of the federal constitution suspected that, at least on some level, the Bill of Rights was merely a scheme to delay and perhaps prevent the ratification of any constitution at all. And once the constitution was ratified by the most narrow of majorities here in our Virginia convention, as a concession to the sizable minority, uh, Virginia included in its ratification 
a separate document, uh, uh, George Wythe, in fact, was presiding over this, that made a very strong argument to Congress that at an early opportunity, amendments to the Constitution should be considered. And Virginia happened to have about 40 suggestions <laughs> to make in that respect. And uh, Madison, once the Constitution had been ratified, became much more open to adding uh, a Bill of Rights by amendment. I, I think he even wanted to incorporate the new language into the body of the Constitution. But in the end, uh, they were added uh, separately. And uh, again, the Constitution, I have argued, I have written this, that the Constitution is intended to endure for ages to come. And it can be amended through the appropriate process to meet the various crises in human affairs. That is why we still have the Constitution today, I suspect. Let me, ask, let me ask you a question while we wait for the next one here. Madison. Madison starts off not as a federalist, but as a nationalist, mm -hmm. and ultimately does this switch and winds up having broken relationships with every federalist except you. He, he, Washington went to his grave saying he would never again speak to Madison. Madison wrote the Virginia Resolution and probably tempered the Kentucky oh, Resolution. I wish you hadn't brought that up. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Um, and, uh, and Madison and Hamilton were at, at loggerheads. How was it that you and Madison did not have a broken relationship or that you were patched it up if you did? Well, again, uh, I've always sought to find consensus with those I were, uh, was interacting with in my various public capacities. And Mr. Madison had a very well studied approach to the design of our federal constitution. He was deeply read on the most instructive volumes of history. And he, he, he advocated for the legitimacy of judicial review at the federal level. And yes, yes, there were a few years when uh, Secretary Madison in the cabinet of President Jefferson fell under the sway of the sage of Monticello, uh, and uh, he, he lost himself for a while. But uh, you know, once, once he emerged uh, from that interlude, uh, he was himself again. And all is well that ends well. I well, would... sp speaking of ending well, the Constitution <laughs> uh, may have been intended to endure for ages to come. This evening um, will not be, um, but um, why don't we, uh, if there's one more student question, yes. um, that, yes. would be, that would be wonderful. Yes. So, um, you can hear me. All right. So, yeah. I have a question, too. I got two stage questions, real quick, um, for Justice Marshall and for Justice Mims. Um, so, like, party politics, you know, kind of gave rise um, with Hamilton in the Federalist Party and the um, and the, uh, Democratic Republicans. And so I kind of wanted to know, like, what was your experience in the early stages of, you know, American politics versus Justice Mims more experienced and more matured experience, um, experience in, like, modern America with that um, sphere? Uh, I suppose in deference to chronology, I should answer first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only half of 267. You know, th this is a very pressing question that you have raised the whole issue of political faction. None of us anticipated that development. We did not imagine that there would be uh, these, these highly organized and competing parties, almost a bicameral uh, uh, antagonism uh, to the process of government. And when it happened, it, it took us unawares. And if Hamilton is to be thought of as the, the chief organizer of the Federalist faction, I would say that my cousin, Mr. Jefferson, was famously uh, the uh, organizer of the Democratic Republicans. And this, this was a source of personal pain to me. I, I remember writing about this at one point, um, that friends who had known each other for years, in some cases had fought together in the army, 
who ended up in these opposing factions, if they should chance to meet each other on, on the street, they would cross to the other side so, to avoid the simple courtesy of lifting your hat in acknowledgement to them. This is not a recipe for self-government. And indeed, um, it, 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 the, the issue that you have risen, it, it has never gone away. Uh, the only change I can think is in the names applied and whether we have two parties or three. The third one's coming and going at regular intervals. Uh, it is, and, and I, will, I, I, will, I will finish uh, on this, but faction, partisanship, the judiciary, I hope, will be the last refuge of those three branches on this phenomenon, to escape that phenomenon, to limit its um, pernicious effects. I suppose it is one thing to be um, elected to office for short periods of time and to be directly accountable to uh, those who have voted you to that position. But that is not the proper posture for an independent and upright judiciary. Judges don't vote. Judges do not legislate. They will hopefully adjudicate. And the Constitution is, is a guide and a control on the judiciary as much as the other two powers. And is it not of the utmost importance to have all who sit on the bench be guided by the laws and not to be swayed by men? The, the, the judiciary, it passes judgment on a man's life, on his reputation, on his property, indeed his all. It is of the utmost importance to have a judiciary as far removed from faction and partisanship as is humanly possible. Now you want me to answer? <laughs> I'll say two quick, two things really quick. So first of all, the, the antidote to malignant partisanship is both courage and civility. And there was one prominent Federalist who voted against the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. That took courage, exceptional courage. That one Federalist was Congressman John Marshall. Second of all, civility. We've already talked about George Washington and civility. There is a modern essay that I would commend to you. It's by the president of the former president of the Czech Republic. The essay is entitled Politics, Morality, and Civility. And I have actually, I, I have bought that essay, reprints of that essay by the, um, by the box load and have given them to um, many, many, many legislators and, uh, and other individuals. So your, your teacher is already nodding that he's very familiar with it. And if you haven't yet read it, I have a sneaking suspicion you will from what he's, uh, from what he's doing. <laughs> it's, it's short, so, uh, so I'm, I, haven't, you know, I hope I haven't harmed your, uh, your, your late night uh, uh, activities. Would you provide me with a copy, please? Indeed, I would. Yes, Thank sir. You. Can I have a copy of Marbury versus Madison? You really want it? No. <laughs> I recently met Patrick Henry. He was in Richmond. Mm -hmm. We were wondering if we invited you back, would you have a spirited conversation oh. with our friend Patrick Henry? Oh, yes. Indeed, I would. <laughs> and uh, there is an example where two people, who were often opposed in their political philosophies were able to have a maintain a respect and a friendship with each other. I instance Mr. Patrick Henry and myself, and I instance uh, Mr. Patrick Henry and George Washington. Henry could not bring himself, he lamented that Henry could not bring himself to support the federal constitution, and Washington 
confided in me that Henry wrote a letter expressing his regret that he was on the opposite side of the father of our country on the question. But yes, it is possible to maintain uh, personal respects and friendships. And frankly, I suspect that if I had not had the endorsement of Patrick Henry when I first ran for Congress after returning from France, um, I'm not so sure that I would have defeated a popular incumbent and been able to go to the House of Representatives. Uh, Henry may have made the difference in my own election. I would like to talk to him again about that. I'll thank you. <laughs> well, we will let you know. I um, Just to, to, to close, I just want to say some of the things you heard from, from now we can step out of role. Mark Greeno, a wonderful historian here in Virginia in the Capitol. Some of the words and many of the words, those are direct quotations yeah. from, remember those letters where I said made me a groupie? Mm -hmm. uh, there were some direct quotations. The one about partisanship, that was from a speech for the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1829-1830. So you have really been privileged, uh, not just to a performance and a dramatic thing, but accurate, historical, uh, really talented uh, uh, per performance. And let me add, when we said our special guest, we didn't tell you who was coming. We came uh, for an evening with Justice Mim, and what we saw, right, is what a good judge Right? What a good person does is ask the questions and what John Marshall did, bring out the best in the people uh, around you and learn from them. So if you'll please join me in thanking both of these gentlemen. For being here this evening. And thanks to you. And now I believe there, uh, we can make our way out and I believe there- oh, Allow me to, to do Allow that. me to. All rise. <laughs>